Hi, Nick van der Kaar here, selling the main line with Long & Foster Real Estate. So today I am heading out to H&L Chalfont in Westchester to interview Skip Chalfont and looking forward to that uh, to discover a little bit more. So, about hi Skip, good to have you here, thanks for doing this. My so pleasure. where did the name Skip come from when it's H&L Chalfont? Oh, my parents nicknamed me that as a baby, so I've been Skip for a long time. Okay, great. Good to clear that up. Now, you grew up in the Westchester area, I correct? I grew up in Westchester. And, you know, I'm still in Westchester, so I tell people I didn't get far in life. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and you developed an interest in antiques from your parents. Now, were they collectors or were they dealers? or? They weren't either. They furnished a house in antiques, but they weren't really collectors. They bought a clock, they had a clock. If they bought a corner cupboard, then they had a corner cupboard. And they never thought about upgrading. So okay. when I moved out of the house and started to set up my own uh, place. I needed furniture. I didn't like the looks of uh, the new furniture at the time. It's like today, or maybe staples and fiberboard, and, and they're basically junk. So, uh, actually my mother said, well, why don't you buy an antique? I bought this uh, Empire mahogany chest of drawers with a marble top for $30. And a few years later, I uh, sort of I guess outgrew it and wanted something earlier, and I sold it for $75. And I thought, wow, this is cool. <laughs> Maybe I should go into the business. So actually, I was teaching school, and then I went to uh, a summer job. I went to uh, work at Philip Bradley Antiques in Downingtown, and I just stayed there for many years and learned the trade there, and then went on my own in 1982. We opened this shop in 1982 okay. and started doing the the, the shows, the Philadelphia show, the Delaware show, the Chester County show, and um, here we are, 30 some years later, still doing it. All right, that's, that's great. So, talk about the first piece you bought. What would be the piece that you said was the most important piece you ever bought? Over that time span, wow, that's a hard question. I had a really good car, Philadelphia low boy, I bought. 20 years ago. Um, it was the Garvin Carver and had shell and streamers and carved knees and that was a very important piece that was all original. Um, God, I've had so many that it's kind of hard to uh, to think of them all but uh, and I, my downfall is I'm a bit of a collector but I collect basically William and Mary furniture and um, so I have to do this to support my habit. Oh, there's so many wonderful things I've owned over the years, I couldn't begin to tell you what they were. I could go through a book and say, oh yeah, look at this, look at that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Do you have one piece other than that that stands out in your memory that you were happy to have sold or to have handled over and above anything else? Well, I had a really good car, Philadelphia Chippendale clock. Uh, I've had some good vine and berry inlaid furniture that I've sold that I like. Uh, that's our logo on our card and stationery is uh, vine and berry inlay that's from Chester County from this basically goes back to the 1730s and 40s. And, um, and I also regret selling some of the things I've had that, uh, because of my collectoritis. I've, I've, uh, some things I'm sorry I sold, but uh, I sold a little tiger maple cost that was about, you know, about 24 inches high at one point. And that was one of the neatest things I've ever owned. And it was all original. And uh, I kind of wish I had that back, but uh, what are you going to do? Sometimes you, you need to eat, so you have to sell a few things. <laughs> right, right. So you talked about how you started at Philip Bradley's in Downingtown. Would you yes. say he was the biggest influence upon you in your education as a dealer? Being there, absolutely. Uh, and, and we had a lot of great collectors that came in and that knew a lot more about their field than either Phil or, or myself knew. And I would often just quiz them. You know, that's how you learn. Right. You either learn by books or touching, owning. Uh, are quizzing people who collect because they they have a lot of knowledge and yep. and they're happy to share. Most people are happy to share, and we had good dealers come in too. Who were happy to share, 
So I learned from a little bit everybody, not just Phil Bradley, but he was a, he was a good teacher. Right. So we had the same thing in ceramics. You know, you had collectors of Derby who, you know, there was certain painters that that was who they collected and they could look at a piece and know who the painter was and you know, we bought everything in those days. Yeah. So same, same thing. So business has changed over those 30 years that you've had your shop. Um, how have you adapted over that time and what are you doing today? Well, we had to adapt somewhat because a lot of the uh, older collector collectors were full or scaling down or passing away. And uh, so we, we branched out into paintings maybe eight, nine years ago. And it's fun to have a new feel because you learn a lot. You've got to keep learning. If you stop learning in life, it's over. So the paintings have been very uh, successful for us and it's been more fun. And even in my collecting habits, I used to not like anything that was made after 1780. And, uh, but now I deal in weather vanes and Navajo blankets and Indian pots and, and other things that are later. Of course, our paintings can run up to the 1960s. Uh, so it's not everything has to be 18th century. So I kind of moved out of the 18th century into the 19th and 20th century. We're even doing some mid-modern Nakashima and uh, you know, 60s and 70s furniture as well, trying to attract a young crowd. So, lots of talk these days about how buying habits have changed. So maybe going back to how your parents used to buy and basically decorating a house rather than necessarily being a collector. Um, what do you see today and see for the future? Of well, there's antiques? still people out there that are buying to furnish a house. You know, they went the proverbial corner cupboard, tall clock, high chest low chest and, and so on. And there's still people out there doing that. They're just uh, fewer and far between. But the younger people don't have the interest, but we have a few younger collectors and we're hoping that it'll uh, catch on. And, and uh, our biggest competitor uh, today is not particularly my friend Philip Bradley and others, but Crate and Barrel and Restoration Hardware are our biggest uh, uh, competitors because these young people can get on their iPhones and order it and it's delivered and it all matches but in essence it's worth a lot less than they pay for it as soon as they get it in their house right. and also most of it's not very good made in China whatever and uh, it doesn't have a resale value so it might take a while for them to figure that out and hopefully they will and, and uh, Antique business will be booming again. It's a very good time to buy antiques, I think. I tell people, even people that think they can't afford, I mean, you can go places and buy a nice high chest of drawers and maybe the feet are replaced, but it's, it's as cheap as a new piece of furniture. And that, you know, that, that's the right way to go. Plus it has 200 years of history, it has beautiful wood, and uh, to me it's a lot more exciting to think. I like to look at some of these furniture that are sitting in this room even. You know, this is a 1740 uh, dressing table. And, you know, here I am sitting next to it, but who else sat next to this in 1760, 1770? This was made in the Philadelphia area. Maybe Thomas Jefferson had his arm on it. Maybe George Washington did. We don't know. We can't say, but it's a possibility because it's the same time frame in the same place. So it's kind of a, it's fun to imagine who sat in front of this, who looked at it, who touched it, who owned it. And most of the time we never know, unless some things do have a provenance, but very rarely do things have a good Loctite provenance. And when they do have a provenance of a famous patriot, then the price goes up uh, many fold. So what, uh, last question for you, and we can highlight some other pieces, but um, <clears throat> What one thing about you would most surprise your customers or other dealers that nobody knows? A lot of my clients are dealers. Uh, we, we, uh, we all buy from each other, believe it or not. And um, yes, quite a bit of our clients are dealers. Okay. You just saw two pieces go out the door. Yes. Who's a dealer? Okay. So you saw the proof in the pudding right there. <laughs> 
oh, that's, that's always been the nature of the antiques business. Yes. And I think when I worked at Bradley, I think 80% of his business was dealer trade. Right. And I remember growing up with my grandfather and father. You know, my grandfather didn't want to sell to, to collectors. He only wanted to sell to the trade. And, you know, it was my father who expanded that and started selling to private people. So, you know. Yeah. So, well, thanks very much. And uh, this is great. Well, good. I'm happy to do it. <laughs>